Okay, good morning. Welcome to Math 261, this multivariable calculus at Delta College. This is Tuesday, November 9, class session. And we've reached exam two, our exam two week, which is dedicated to your review and construction of exam two. Now you have a homework problems that you're handing in tonight and I have one question I received on those that I could clarify something, but exam two is going to be released tonight about the time you hand in your two homework problems. And it'll be due seven days later on Tuesday, November 16. Uh, exam two is going to be under the same format as exam one. The rules, the instructions are the same. I believe there are five problems on it. I We'll make a firm commitment, but five was a target, and five is what I have ready. I'm just going to proofread some things before we release it tonight. Uh, remember, this exam is Tuesday to Tuesday, and I've already pointed out the last exam might not be Tuesday to Tuesday because of the grade deadline. But other than that, this exam is going to be run exactly the same as the first exam, and same conditions for the last exam, but the week of availability might be shifted. So I had a short question on 5.6 homework I received, which we can handle just by looking at the homework. I want to give you some other example of change of variables and multiple integrals, just how to speak and set up that change of variables because you have to pay attention to the Jacobian, which is the determinant of a matrix. And then you need to take the absolute value of the Jacobian when you're inserting into the matrix. So sometimes people use absolute value bars to represent determinant, which is okay. But remember the Jacobian is taking the absolute value of the determinant. So I don't wanna get necessarily into double absolute value bars, but we'll, we'll illustrate that with some basic example. Maybe you have another example you'd like to ask. Other than that, uh, you can bring the questions you want to ask and that's all. I haven't prepared anything else other than the questions you want to ask. And then on Thursday, the same, except on Thursday, you'll have the exam in your hand. So you'll have some more focused idea on what the exam contains. I'm just writing down the number of this problem. So if you have a question you'd like to address, throw it into the chat or you can speak it out and interrupt. Other than that, these are the first two items on my list today. Maybe you'd like to talk about mass and center of mass. Maybe you'd like to talk about visualizing that. Maybe you'd like to talk about executing integrals in Mathematica so you can double check your work if you were doing things by hand. A common question over this week has been what integrals do I need to evaluate by hand and what integrals can I evaluate with a tool such as Mathematica. And I think our standing rule is gonna be, you can use a tool to evaluate the integrals unless the instructions specifically say, show how to evaluate, show how to evaluate this integral. And I'll probably be more explicit with each step of the calculation or something, show how to evaluate this indefinite integral showing each step. So you've seen on the homework that you're preparing that, or that you've prepared that sometimes these evaluations can seriously get out of hand. You hope that there's some symmetry present to help you make some evaluations, but that's not always the case. And even things that are able to be evaluated still might multiply into very large busy work that is too easy to make an error on. So I encourage you on all 
multiple integrals, all integrals you perform whatsoever to double check them with an appropriate technology. But you also want to be able to evaluate things by hand if that was requested of you. Okay, so throw the questions in the chat if you like, but I'm gonna look first at this question I received about the homework. And I am going to pull up a copy of the book and look at the statement of the problem on my website, which is slightly different, but equivalent. And let's, I'm trying to find, oh, okay, so let's pull up a copy of the book online before I share that with you. So from the syllabus, you have a link to the physical copy of the book while the electronic online copy of the book. And I'm in the wrong course. Okay, here we go, 261 syllabus. Calculus volume three. String Herman. Open it up and let's look at problem 56342. And I'll share the screen now. Mass and center of mass, 56342. Slide down to the problems here. And this is what we're looking at. Made it somewhat larger here. So it says, let Q be the solid situated outside the sphere and inside the upper hemisphere where R equals one. Now the equation that's given, oh, sorry. No, I don't want to update. But let's see if I can get out of that. So let me slide back to the problem, sorry. And Yeah, this is their online kind of app version of the text. So it's not super responsive. I kind of prefer the PDF. But it says, let Q be the solid situated outside the sphere, X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared equals Z. And you could find the center and radius of that by completing the square, or you can switch that to spherical coordinates and understand where that sphere is. We've talked about the equation of that sphere that's offset from the origin. That sphere is resting on the origin. That sphere includes the origin 0, 0, 0, because you see that 0, 0, 0 for x, y, and z satisfies this equation. But then they say inside the upper hemisphere, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared. Now this expression right here, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared, that is a full sphere of radius r, but they only want you to consider, they say, the upper hemisphere. So on my paper, I'll write this, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared. That's a full sphere of radius r, but they want you to consider only the upper hemisphere. So it's something like a paperweight. Now, 
in my expression of the problem, which we'll switch to next, I wrote the upper hemisphere as square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r. Now, both of these say a sphere of radius r. And in fact, this expression right here, the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r is still a complete sphere, upper and lower half. So if I wanted, but, but the indication is you're going to use the upper hemisphere only. I said something about this radius one, I want it to be larger than one because it's gonna contain this other sphere. It's gonna be kind of like this other sphere is an air bubble inside the upper hemisphere. Now, if I wanted to state that as strictly the upper hemisphere, and here I'll go back to my paper, what's the proper way to state this equation where I'm only asking for the upper part? Well, that would be solving for z. r squared minus x squared minus y squared. And when I solve for z, z squared equals r squared minus x squared minus y squared. But when I take the square root of both sides, I would ordinarily introduce a plus minus, the plus minus plus upper hemisphere minus lower hemisphere. There's no plus minus here, so you just have to accept this invisible plus. This is also stating the upper hemisphere. So you could express it exactly like this or like this. You have your choice. This does not allow any z to be negative. Both the expression in the book and the expression that I wrote on the paper definitely allow x, y, and z to be negative. There's no problem with x, y, or z being negative. Here I was emphasizing the r and the distance, the sphere represents a distance from the origin. Here the book was simplifying it so that you don't have to look at the square root. But you have to remember that when you see a five or a seven on the right-hand side of the book's equation, that the radius is root five or root seven. Here I was just displaying the radius. So this would be, both of these would be the entire sphere. And this would be only the upper hemisphere. But note that the problem specifies itself in words, upper hemisphere. So you are only to use the upper part of that sphere. And then there's a kind of an air bubble inside there. And given a certain density, we want to know what we need to choose for our capital R to achieve a certain mass. Okay, <coughs> so I'll let you work on that problem now. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious because problem seven, I'm trying to remember is problem seven a messy problem or not. So let's just take a scan of problem seven. And here in problem seven, I'm doing a change of coordinates, I think. So that'll be the next example we look at. Yeah, so this is a kind of a combination of five, six, and five, seven. It's got a change of coordinates in it that you're responsible for. So we'll practice changing coordinates again. But I'm gonna use this to evaluate the mass and the center of mass of a certain region. So I don't mind drawing this region because you've probably already drawn this region. And I'll make a comment about this, but I'll leave the execution to you. Let's 
So I'm going to go back to my paper and I'm going to I'll make sure that I'm sharing this screen with you. This is the problem we're talking about, a parallelogram with certain corners and a particular density. So this parallelogram is with corners 0, 0, 1, 2, 5, 3, and 4, 1. So it looks like this. And we'll toss some scale on here. 4, 2, 2, 4, 6, x, y. Because this will lead into a good example to practice change of variables. So you have this region R, and you have a density function that every point in this thin plate has a density of two minus x minus two squared minus y minus one squared. And you can see where this thing is most dense. It's when these two squares are the smallest because you're subtracting squares, you're subtracting positive numbers. So anything you subtract will subtract from 20, except if x was two and y was one. At two and one, which is right here, this thing has got the highest density it can have. And then as you float away from two and one, the density is detracted from 20, subtracted from 20. And you could imagine, you could imagine a, this is an elliptic paraboloid built on top of this parallelogram in three dimensions, if you had the third dimension. And then you could see visually what the density represents. Now, based on these lines, why don't I just integrate this and do the mass directly? That's integral of the little bit of mass units over this region R. It's a double integral of delta of x and y times the little bit of mass units is density times area. Area in terms of x and y. The little bit of area in terms of x and y. So why don't I just set this up as dx dy? Well, the problem is, as I describe this region with x and y, I've got kind of multiple entries, multiple exits. If I pick an x and shoot through here with y, I've got lower line entry, left line exit, then I've got lower line entry, upper line exit, then I've got right side entry, upper line exit. So I've got, naturally got three dimension or three regions the way this is laid out. And similarly, if I shot parallel to the x-axis after fixing a y. So the function, the density function is not complicated. It's the limits that are unhappy. So I can switch these limits, but when I switch these limits in this problem, I lose the symmetry I lose some of the effective symmetry in the delta function. This delta function is very easy to integrate with respect to x or y. But if I replace the x and y with some type of linear transformation, we can do an example of a linear transformation in a second, that's gonna complicate this function. And not so much for the mass, if I do a linear substitution for x and y, I'll still be integrating linear factors if I just do the mass, which is delta dA. But then the y moment, the moment about the y-axis, 
which is x delta dA. If I change this to another coordinate system, do you see even the x times delta is going to mix the x and the y? I'll be multiplying this y piece by an x, so I'll be mixing the linear factors. This is going to be messy. In either coordinate system, So in this problem, in rectangular coordinates, I have nice integrand. Difficult limits. But if I switch to another coordinate system, let's say alternate coordinates, I may have simplified the limits, but I may have an awkward or a difficult integrand. So this is the trade-off you make when you do a change of variables, when you do a change of coordinates. The best case scenario is the change of coordinates makes the integrand and the limits nicer. And we can try something like that. But in general, you can't depend that you get the best of both worlds. So you're gonna have to say, should I slug through the hard limits because the integrand is nice? Or should I, possibly increase the difficulty of the integration because I'd like to deal with nice limits, maybe constant limits. So this is a trade-off. In this problem, the mass is not hard to execute by hand. This could be executed directly. Well, I didn't specify that you had to show every step, but the M y and the mx, the moments, the first moments right here. The my and the mx are called the first moments. Moment about the y-axis, moment about the x-axis. These two integrals are awkward to execute. But if you like, either in rectangular coordinates or in an alternate coordinate system, you can have Mathematica execute both and you can see that you get the same center of mass either way. Okay. So those are the comments about some of the questions I received over the weekend. So I'll leave you to those. Let's do, unless you have a question you'd like to ask, I want to state the change of variables formula nicely. Maybe I can show you an example where the limits and the integrand get nicer. But I want to, first of all, show you a famous example dealing with spheres and ellipses that you should just be aware of. You should just have in your toolbox. So let's look at the change of coordinates formula in general. It says you have some multiple integral that you'd like to evaluate. It could be single, double, triple, some function contributing to some region. Here, it's in terms of area. So I'm choosing a double integral as an example. But this area could be awkward to draw. So I recommend you draw the area you're given and then you draw any potential area you're transforming to side by side so you see the two areas. So let's say in the XY space, this region is awkward to execute for any particular reason. 
in the example we just did, we were looking at a parallelogram. Through a change of variables, maybe you could describe that easier in another coordinate system, U and V. And maybe you get really lucky in the, this coordinate system, the limits turn out to be just constants. You know, U goes from A to B, B goes from C to D. And I want you to focus on the fact that this is like describing two functions. Here, I'm describing new variables, U and V, in terms of X and Y. But in order to do this coordinate transformation, I have to know how to go both directions. So what I really want to know is how to describe X and Y in terms of U and V. And we'll do an example. This choice right here is often direct or obvious, but what I have to do is I have to invert that description. So I solve for X and Y in terms of U and V. And then I can rewrite the integral in the U and V coordinates. Maybe this nice region here is called S. Then I can reevaluate this function by plugging in these two expressions for U and V into the function for X and Y. I can use the nicer coordinate system U and V, but this is what I'm trying to emphasize right now. I have to pay for that privilege by including the Jacobian as a compensation factor. And the Jacobian is a determinant and the compensation factor is the absolute value of the Jacobian. So that's what I wanna make sure. that you don't get bothered by these absolute value signs versus what people typically use to describe the determinant of a matrix. To shorten this notation, people often use absolute value signs to indicate the determinant of a matrix. This is partial, F partial. U, partial, F partial V, partial G partial U, partial G partial V. Sometimes people just shorten this to partial X partial U, partial X partial V. It's the way I presented on the formula sheet, partial y, partial u, partial y, partial v. Using x and y as the dependent variable instead of f and g as the function names. But when you see an absolute value bar on a matrix or on a set of four numbers like this, then people are talking about the determinant. I mean, legally, they should be saying, the absolute value of a matrix itself, but just to shorten the notation. Instead of writing absolute value bars for a determinant and the brackets for the matrix, people just shorten it this way. So these three expressions are all the same. They're the Jacobian. And that's what I insert into here. After I do this, then I take the absolute value of that expression. So let's look at an example. Maybe I can find a 
first of all, a nice linear example. And then I want to do an example that's specifically related to the famous case of managing spheres and managing ellipsoids, managing circles and managing ellipses. So first I'm gonna pick something linear here just to do a simple evaluation. And I'm looking in section five, seven, unless you have a favorite you'd like to suggest. I'm looking at 392, 393, or, and then for the second one, 394, 395 is what catches my attention. Uh, 396 and 397 are kind of interesting. Let's look at 397. 397 is an interesting problem. So it's posted in your book, but I'm just going to state it briefly here. Evaluate this kind of strange integrand here. So double integral R and the integrand is X cubed plus three X squared Y plus three X Y squared plus Y cubed with respect to area over region and they draw this region here. R. And I'll just do this not as beautifully as they do it, but we'll do it to scale. X, Y, line, 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 line. Let me shade in this region R. Okay, so this, let's look at it, you know, just objectively. It's just a polynomial. In fact, if you stop to think about it for a second, it's a kind of a recognizable and well-known polynomial. We'll come to that in a second. But even at face value, this is just a polynomial, easy to integrate with respect to X and Y. The region is described in the XY plane. This dA must be dx dy. So as it is, we're supposed to evaluate this in the xy plane. For that reason, even though the book doesn't do this, sometimes I put a little xy here at the base of A subscripts to remind me that this area element is in the xy plane. But here, the function is nice and the limits are awkward. Because if I want to evaluate this, I either fix a y, I could enter on the y-axis and exit on this diagonal line, or I could enter on the diagonal line and exit on the diagonal line. I would have to write this with two multiple integrals to evaluate it as I've been given. I'd have to use two multiple integrals to evaluate this with respect to y and then x, or with respect to x, pick an x and then y. So the question is, could I choose a coordinate transformation that would make this easier to execute? And the author suggests this coordinate transformation. u equals x plus y, and v equals x minus y. Now that's just a partial suggestion and we're gonna to have to draw it to find out why. But they're telling us, why don't you look at this region in 
a different coordinate system in the UV coordinate system. So we're going to take this, excuse me, and redraw this side by side, X, Y coordinates and U and V coordinates. Uh, I don't want to go crazy with the colors. So let's just draw, first of all, the X and Y region to that. I'll just keep everything kind of monochromatic. This is the original region R. And look at the features of R. It's using prominently these two lines, x plus y equals one, and x plus y equals two. The line with intercepts of two, both axes, and the line with intercepts of one, both axes. So this is a strong suggestion. X plus Y is constant. X plus Y ranges from one to two. This is a strong suggestion that that should be one of my variables. Where does the X minus Y come from? He doesn't explain to us, but let's try and use this substitution and see what happens. I think I will slightly change colors here. So let's take this to the UV universe. And let's focus on these corners just to see where this goes. For example, if X is one and Y is zero, what happens to one zero in this coordinate transformation? Well, one zero becomes U equals one, V equals one. So I'm not sure where to mark that yet. I think I better be kind of generic about my picture so far until I get exactly where things go to. I don't know what this gets transformed into, this region R. So I'm going to be generic here, call this 1, 1. But I also see that 2, 0 gets transformed similarly into 2, 2. So this point and this point get transformed into 1, 1 and two, two, but in the UV plane. Now, likewise, let's look at these two points, zero comma two. This zero comma two gets transformed into U equals two and V equals minus two. U equals two and V equals minus two. See, I was smart to leave myself some space here or just lucky, u equals two and v equals minus two is down here. And this last point, zero one, goes to one and minus one for u and v, which is right here. Now you say, oh, I see what's happened. I've taken this region R and I've kind of rotated it clockwise. It's like you took this trapezoid and you rotated it clockwise, but you actually did more than that. And this is why we need the absolute value. And this is why we need the Jacobian. So let's pay careful attention to what you actually accomplished in this transformation. I want to name these points one, two, three, and four. Call those corners one, two, three, and four, and then carefully track where they went in this drawing. They went to this point, one, one, this point, two, two, this point, two, minus two, that's the third corner, and this point, which was one and minus one, that's the fourth corner. So what you notice about these, do you see the one, two, three, four? When I count here, I'm counting 
when I walk from one to two to three to four and back to one, I'm walking counterclockwise. But do you notice in the UV plane, from one to two to three to four and back to one is going clockwise. So somehow I've actually reversed this template. Now I could picture it like this and I'm looking for a post-it note that I could manipulate. And I should have lots of post-it notes in my office, but I don't see one right now. So I'm going to take this post-it note and cut it with the scissors to fit my purpose. Okay, so be patient while I cut this post-it note with the scissors. And it's almost like there's that trapezoid. I didn't choose an excellent color because it doesn't show up nicely in the camera. But what happens with this one, two, three, four, is I didn't just slide this over to here, right? Because when you see the one, two, three, four, they're kind of reversed. What I did is I took this trapezoid and I literally flipped it upside down so that this is now one, two, three, and four. And if I showed you the trapezoid, here's corner one, and here's corner one, here's corner two, and here's corner two, here's corner three, and corner three, corner four, and corner four. So I took the trapezoid that was this way, looking at that face, and to orient it here, I flipped it over and transferred it over here. Now I'm looking at this expression. I didn't cut this for size either, but do you see that the size of the trapezoid has changed? And that's not hard to measure. This trapezoid doesn't fit here, but it's kind of almost covering up the black trapezoid. When I flip it over here, it's not nearly covering up this trapezoid. Did I truly change the size of these? Because I'm just using the numbers one, two, one, two but you really did change the size of these because if you look at <coughs> this long edge right here, this long edge has, has what length? It's a hypotenuse of a two by two triangle. So four, four, eight, two root two is this length right here. But over here, this length is clearly four units. So I have both magnified and flipped the region R create the new region S. So I want to say to you, S is both magnified and a flipped or reoriented version of R. Okay, now let's go to the execution. This region could be executed nicely if I fix a U and then run Vs from one to the other. Notice if I fix a V and then run Us from left to right, I do run into multiple entry curves. But if I fix a value of U, and shoot through this along the v-axis. I only have one entry curve, one exit curve. So this is a favorable region for limits of integration. We call this S. And we just have to know how we're going to pay for this altering of R. So we write the integrals, the double integral of R of this function with respect to area in the xy plane is going to be transformed into a double integral of s of this transformed functions with respect to the area in the uv plane. But it's not simply changing the names of the letters and rewriting the limits. I have to also insert the absolute value of the Jacobian 
of this transformation. Okay, so now we need to describe the transformation then. And you say, we've already described the transformation and used it. Well, we did use the transformation to draw the nice region, but we don't know what X is in terms of U and V. What we need to do is understand how do we go from the nice region back to the original region? And that means I have to solve this system of equations for X and Y. Now this is a linear system of equations, so that solving is not hard. I'll let you do that solving, but I want you to notice if you add U and V, you get two X's and no Y's. And that means that two X is U plus V. That means that X is one half U plus one half V. And notice if you take U minus V, you get two Y's and no X's. So two Y's is U minus V. So Y is one half U minus one half V. This is what's called a linear transformation. Linear in terms of X and Y produces an inverse transformation. This is the inverse transformation, also linear in terms of U and V. And this is what I need to compute the Jacobian. And when you say Jacobian of U and V, what you have is the determinant of partial X, partial U, partial X, partial V, partial Y, partial U, partial Y, partial V. Since this is a linear transformation, these derivatives, these partial derivatives are not complicated. So we'll go down here and calculate. So pay attention to the notation. I'm calculating something in the variables U and V by differentiating the variables X and Y. But here, all the derivatives are just constants. Derivative of x with respect to u is one half. Derivative of x with respect to v is one half. Derivative of y with respect to u is one half. Derivative of y with respect to v is minus one half. But now you're gonna see the value of this absolute value right here. Remember this says determinant. This says absolute value. Because what is the determinant of this two by two matrix? product of the main diagonal minus the product of the off diagonal, you get negative one fourth minus one fourth, you get negative two fourths or negative one half. And I do not want the Jacobian to be negative value. So I'm gonna take the absolute value of that. But I do want you to tell you the meaning of this one half negative. What's the meaning of this one half negative? In this problem, this area S is twice the area of this area R. In fact, you could do that by actually computing the areas. This is a triangle, large triangle, one half base times height is large triangle here. It's one half two times two. This large triangle area is two. And then you subtract this small triangle area, which is one half, one half base times height. Do you see two minus one half? This is area three halves. But if you calculated the area of this trapezoid, now let me just draw the squares. Here's a square of unit area one. Here's a square of unit area one, because I chose in my scale to be one and two here. And then here's two half triangles, each of area one half. So the area of S is three units. Do you see this transformation magnified R? And since I want to keep the value of the integral the same, I gotta, so to speak, unmagnify S. 
But what does the minus sign represent in this Jacobian? The minus sign represents the reorientation. So the fact that I took this trapezoid and flipped it over and expressed it here. So both the minus sign and the number have meaning. Now you don't always have a constant number here. So the Jacobian doesn't always just scale regions, but here it just simply scaled the region R and rotated it. Okay, now let's execute the integral of F over S with respect to the area elements U and V. And we insert the Jacobian absolute value. I have to take the absolute value of minus one half. So in the notation, absolute value sign here means determinant of matrix. And absolute value here means the absolute value of this function or number. Okay, now we're gonna return to the limits and the function itself. So first of all, how do we set the limits of this region with respect to U and V? I'm gonna kind of slide off the paper almost, but the U limits go from one to two. And the V limits go from lower diagonal line to upper diagonal line. This diagonal line right here is V equals U. And this diagonal line right here is V equals minus U. So these limits are not entirely constant. I go from minus U to U. When U is two, I go from minus two to two. When U is one, I go from minus one to one. When U is one and a half, I go from minus one and a half to positive one and a half. So these limits are not constant, but they're not obnoxious either. I can cover this with one integral. Now, I also have my one half right here. That's the Jacobian, absolute value of minus one half is one half. But now it's time to understand this function. F cubed plus three X squared, Y plus three X Y squared plus Y cubed. If you're thinking about this function, you understand that this is a perfect cube of X plus Y. Binomial expansion, however you do this. If you cube X plus Y, you get X cubed plus three X squared Y plus three X Y squared plus Y cubed. Binomial coefficients, Pascal's triangle, any way you organize that. So what I want to do is change this function into my new coordinate system. And then I get this very happy break that x plus y cubed, since u is equal to x plus y, this just is expressed as u cubed. So I got the limits to be nicer, and I got the integrand to be nicer. This is the best of both worlds. And I can quickly evaluate this, and then we'll take a short break. I evaluate with respect to v, u is the constant limits, u on the outside, then I set the limits for v, so I evaluate from the inside out, so this is one half u cubed integrate with respect to v. What I get is one half u cubed v. But now I got to evaluate that and pay attention to where you're putting the limits. You're putting the limits in for v. And I will also show you how to evaluate this originally inside Mathematica too. One to two. These are the U limits after I do this insertion. So when I do this insertion, I get U right here. I get U to the fourth, one half U fourth. When I plug in the minus U for V, I get minus one half U to the fourth. You say, oh no, it's zero. No, no, no. When you plug in the minus V, you get minus one half u to the fourth. Remember, fundamental theorem of calculus, you're subtracting these two. So what you really have here to evaluate in the end is not very messy. 
integral of one to two of u to the fourth du. Now this is one fifth u to the fifth, which is two to the fifth over five. minus one to the fifth over five. Just the one to the fifth power, not the one over five to the fifth power. So this is 32 minus one is 31 over five, which is uh, 6.25, uh, 6.20, excuse me. Exactly, that's not an approximation. Okay, so now, I've taken this ugly region and made it into one double integral with the Jacobian. So I wanted to give a better demonstration of Jacobian. I also want to show you how you could evaluate this directly in Mathematica and how you could evaluate this directly in Mathematica. And I want to visualize this function over the region. So what am I actually, actually counting? You could say it's volume, or you could say it's density and mass, density for F, mass for the integral. But I want to illustrate that for you visually, unless you have some other question you'd like to look at. This is a good place to take a break before we go into mathematic here. So let's say let's come back at, Oh, 959, let's call it 906. And I'm gonna mute my microphone, stretch my legs, and you're invited to do the same. And then let's do some demonstration of this visually inside Mathematica, because I want to show you how you can deal with messy regions, even Mathematica directly. Come back in a few minutes here.
Okay, we're back. And I was just typing into a Mathematica notebook, which I'll share with you right now. It's just prepping some of these things that I want to show you. So let's look at this exercise visually as far as we can. Let's see if we can construct some nice image for this. So I'm sharing. And I got this expression right here. Okay, I'll change the typeface in a moment. Hang on, but let me finish the thing I was typing right here. Let's see what this gives me, region plot, uh, variable dependencies, x equals. So I think I have to put this inside braces. And Mathematica is thinking about plotting this region. And I hope I haven't confused it. No, nope, it doesn't like how I did that. So what we're going to do is go to documentation. So let's do a whole share screen. And I'm looking at the whole mess here. I'll blow up the typeface in a second, but I want to look at the documentation and look at region plot. I don't see anything I obviously typed as an error in there, but let's ask Mathematica for the documentation on region plot. And I'll move that window down where we can see it. And get rid of those error messages. Why doesn't it like this? Uh, it does not have a value. Dynamic updating may be disabled. Okay, so we got an issue right here that. I did an update on my system the other day and it recognizes the word I'm searching for, but it doesn't want to search inside the documentation center. Okay, that's not happening. And let's just see if it wants to execute anything right here. So what's, I typed in the function. Now I'm gonna make this larger for you. I typed in the function and I could decode these error messages. But first, let me see if it just understands, if it's just awake. What's f of two and three? Okay, I haven't executed this function right here. I've defined it carefully. I reserved the X and Y, delayed evaluation. Let's move this out of my way just in case that was causing errors. Let's eliminate those and let's eliminate these error messages. So is it unhappy with this function that I've defined? Okay, I've defined the function right there. Can I evaluate the function? Okay, so now I can evaluate the function. So let's see if that causes this. Okay, here's the problem that I left out the Y right here. Okay, false alarm. So I was defining things correctly. I left out a Y there. I may not have evaluated that function. So here's our original region right here. And notice I described that as X greater than or equal to zero, Y greater than or equal to zero, and X plus Y goes from one to two. And that encloses this trapezoid. It doesn't set the limits of integration, it just encloses the trapezoid. And we do the region S similarly by evaluating the region S and put those in braces. Let's see if I can evaluate them side by side, or maybe I could find a better way to evaluate this. Let's say this is u goes from one to two and v goes from 
minus u to plus u. So let's see if it accepts this. Minus u less or equal to v less or equal to u. Let's see how it interprets this. I want it to be greater than or equal to right here. And I'm gonna let u run from what? Uh, minus 0 0.5 to 2.5. Okay, I'll keep that. And I'll let this run from 2.5 to 2.5. This will be the V. Okay, so roughly the regions I expect. Uh, notice that this is not one-to-one. -one. This first box is one-to-one. -one. I could set this box from one to one, but notice I have three U limits and five V limits. I can make five U limits. And now this is more one to one. Okay, but how do I evaluate this function over the region R? So let's try this, integrate. And let's show you a funny command called bool. So I wanna integrate the function f of x comma y, but I only want to evaluate it over this trapezoid here that's called r. So bool is a command that says, I'll return a one if the statement inside here is true, and I'll return a zero if the statement inside here is not true. So let's take this expression that defined my region which was x greater than zero, y greater than equals zero, x and y are going from one to two. And let's set that inside there. And then let's integrate over this whole region right here from zero to two and from zero to two. Now be careful because you're saying, oh, you're integrating from zero to two and zero to two. No, I may have written this integral that way, but the bool command returns a one only if I'm in this region, if this works out to our satisfaction. So let's do some indentation so I can look at this. Good. Now notice I'm doing a double integral with one integrate command. I'm not doing the integrate integrate. I'm not doing iterate an integral. And this is okay because I've set these limits to be constants and I've defined the function of two variables. So this is only equal to the function if I'm inside this region, even though I'm specifying the whole square zero to two, zero to two. Let's see how this evaluates. It evaluates the 31 over five, which is what we expected it to evaluate to. But now let's evaluate the integral over S here on the right. And I could do that as a single integrate command or an iterated integrate command. First, I'm gonna demonstrate an iterated integrate command. Integrate and integrate and insert myself some commas. And what am I gonna integrate? I'm gonna integrate the transformed function which was simply u cubed, that's x plus y cubed. And I'm gonna integrate that over what region? First, v goes from, I think I've got braces out of place, but I'll fix that in a second, minus u to u. And then I'm gonna terminate that integrate command. Oh, that's why I got my braces out of place. That's why it's angry. I should just place these inside. First of all, I'm doing them on the inside integral. And then I'm gonna terminate the inside integral. And then I'm gonna do it on the outside integral. So uh, I still don't feel good about my commas and braces here, but let's see how this works out. Now I'm gonna set u from one to two. Good. And make sure I have matching braces everywhere. I think I do. Okay, I think we have that set up correctly. 
This is the simplified integral, much nicer limits. I don't have to do any fancy trick with this Boole function. And what do I get? 62 over five. Okay, what did I leave out? I left out my compensation factor. I left out my Jacobian. So I have to multiply this by one half. Now they match. I want you to see that I could also write this as one integrate command as I did above, but I have to be careful about my order of U and V in that sense. So let me re-execute this below as, oops, one integrate command. So let's just integrate that expression. But notice the problem with the order in the U and V. So you might say, oh, this is the order you want to use. Let's do U and V like this. And notice that's not how Mathematica interprets it. Mathematica actually did the U integral and then the V integral. This is why I'd prefer you to use iterated integration so you know what integral is being performed first. If I want this to work properly, what I have to do is reverse these here. So Mathematica sets the outer limits first. That's what we do, but it writes it first in the integrate command, and then the inner limits follow. That's how I'm going to get 31 over 5. So I wanted to point out to you that if you use integrate like that, you have to be very careful about the order that you put those limits in. I prefer to use the iterated integral. You say, why didn't you use the integrated integral here? Because the limits literally were constants both ways, so there was no danger of a misinterpretation there. Okay, now last thing is let's visualize this function over this region. So that's going to be probably uh, region plot 3D, or should I just evaluate that function? Let's see if I can use that bool trick again. Copy. And say, let's plot 3D. Well, first of all, I'll write what I wrote, but I'll change integrate to plot 3D. And let's see if we're interpreting this correctly. What this will do is plot this function over the square zero to two, zero to two, but it will only, this bool command will give me a one if I'm inside this region and a zero otherwise. So actually the surface will be zero height unless I'm inside the region I'm interested in. That's what I'm intending to see here. Let's see what happens. And that's kind of what happens right there. The region is expressed as zero if I'm outside that trapezoid, and then the value of that trapezoid if I'm inside that region R. Uh, I'm not crazy about seeing the zero parts of this and the scaling is zero to two, zero to two X and Y, but zero to eight. So I've got a you know scaling issue right here. Uh, these are two, this is a box ratio of four, well, uh, two to two to eight which is one to one to four. So that wouldn't do if I wanted to express that nicely. I think that would be a little bit too extreme. If I did it in true one to one units, it'd be one to one to two. That's a little bit extreme and hard to see and visualize. Uh, one to one to one wouldn't be true one to one units, but it would be a little bit easier to visualize right here. Could I do this without the bool? And could I just graph the function that's transformed? So let's try another plot 3D. And let's take out the bool and just say that the region is such, right? So let's plot U cubed. And let's take this, we're gonna to try to plot the transformed region now, where 
u v goes from minus u to u and u goes from one to two and we'll bring the box ratios in if we want so let's try this plotting read right here not a machine size real number is it the case that i have these things out of order is it doesn't like my order let's find out if it's that that it just doesn't like the order yes that is what happened it wanted the constant order first and you say this doesn't look at all like what i was expressing well let's set the plot range plot range to be excuse me plot range to be I'm sorry i gotta keep my eye on that too if you have a question i have a chat window closed now it's open let's say the plot range is going to be as i expressed it when we did the integrals minus 2.5 to 2.5 and then copy that comma paste comma paste get rid of this but this is going to be zero to ten about minus one to nine uh, i have too many objects inside here yes you're right thank you Okay, do I have everybody lined up correctly now? Yeah, there's that little space right there. There's the surface above the region. And you want to see this side by side. Let me take the region S. I meant to put a capital S there. And let's put this side by side with the surface above the region here. And let's enclose it in braces so that I can show the two things side by side. There. There's the region right there that I'm integrating over. And there's the function that's standing over that region. I can blow this up so that they're a little more. I could even put the region S inside that plot 3d command i'm wondering so what if i said let's show i it's a question about whether i get to do this region plot right here since it's a two-dimensional thing and the plot 3d is a three-dimensional thing but let's try it so we might have to modify these two So first thing I do is put in, excuse me, put in semicolons to suppress the output of those. And then let's see if it's good enough to just say show region S comma, and we got to see, give this a name called surface. And surface. I don't think this is going to work. See, because it doesn't quite know what to do with region S. So I'm going to have to find region S as region plot 3D, I expect. Let's try that and see if that works. So there, there, plot 3D. Let's try this. Plot 3D, zero with these limits okay so i'm modifying this too much here but i'll show you what i'm going to get in a second so now let's try this call this uh, new region s new region s let me see if this executes Okay, it does execute, but it doesn't execute in the height. So we're going to move this plot range down to here. Now let's try it. There we go. That's what I wanted to see. So let me show you what I did. 
to show you both the region, the shadow cast by that surface and the surface itself. And you could do this and then you could decorate this with different sized things. So before I explain, well, let's first explain what I did. The new region S is a zero height surface with these trapezoid limits. The surface is a U cubed height surface with these trapezoid limits. Okay, so that wasn't too complicated. But if I want to illustrate this better, I'll say plot style. And I will put in red and eh, doesn't matter, blue, red, blue opacity is 0 0.5. And then I'll do the same thing down here, comma space. Ah. I think I wanted this one to be gray. Let's just see what happens. Okay, now I have the shadow cast in gray and the surface in blue, and there's a little bit of transparency to help me see it. Uh, let's get rid of this. Let's make this 0 0.5 here so that, that I don't have this empty space all to the right. The 2.5 is good. The 1.9 is good but then I'm gonna distort that. Oh, I need to, I can even go from one on the U. Okay, that is better. Let's make it 0 0.5, got it. Okay, now it's kind of centered in that window, but it's distorted in size. So let's change the box ratios. And then I should stop playing with this. So box ratios. And so what should my box ratios be? Three units X, five units, 10 units. Should I try three to five to 10? That would make all the units one to one. It still might be a little bit tall for our taste. Now all the units are one to one here, honestly represented one to one, but that's a little tall for our taste. So let's cut it down to three, five, five, distort the height, but make this easier to look at. Okay, uh, one more toy I'm gonna do here. Don't forget uh, you can sometimes visualize a solid by including a filling. So I'm gonna say filling equals bottom, and that will fill in the bottom of that surface down to the plane. Oh, it only fills in to the very bottom edge of the surface. And I don't like this so much because even though it fills it in, I don't see the edges of the fill. You could probably look up the documentation on filling to make that a better looking surface. I guess I'll take it out right now. Okay, good. So what we did is we see two regions here, I'll show you how to do the region plot, and then show you how to integrate in the bad region directly using this bool command, and then show you what the good integrate looks like. Pay attention to the difference between integrate, executing a double integral, and integrate executing a multiple integral because the limits may be in an order different than you expect. And I get the same 31 out of five each time. And here's plotting the surface directly over the region with the bool command. And here's plotting the surface in the new region, just with a little more decoration using the shadow cast by this and the surface itself. Okay, good. So I'm going to save that and put that away. Got it. Uh, what should I save it as? 261 dash exercise dash 05 dash 07 dash 397. Okay.
I'll just leave this on my desktop for the moment and stop sharing. Okay, back to paper. So this is this kind of fully executed example. If you don't have another question I want to bring, I want to bring another important coordinate transformation. And the reason why coordinate transformations are so powerful, particularly in the use of circles, ellipses, spheres, and ellipsoids. But let me just write this here. So let's do another example where I find the volume of an ellipsoid. Let's say calculate the volume of the ellipsoid Let's say x squared over two plus y squared over three plus z squared over four. I'll just pick some common numbers equals one. In terms of x, y, and z coordinates, both spheres and ellipsoids are kind of equally annoying to calculate over. But I want to show you that if I make a smart coordinate transformation, in fact, two coordinate transformations in a row, I can turn this into a very famous formula. Put a less than or equal to to be everything inside or calculate the volume inside the ellipsoid leave the equal signs there, that's your choice. So let me take a crack at drawing this, just x goes from two to minus two root Remember, this is the intercepts rooted. y goes from three to minus three root. And z goes from four to minus four rooted. That means from two to minus two. I'm not trying to cleverly indicate scale or anything like that. I'm just trying to draw kind of an egg or ellipsoid in space. That's a horrible ellipsoid. Calculate the volume R inside the ellipsoid. Let's call this egg R, just three dimensional region. I want to show you that I can evaluate the volume of that with my geometry knowledge. If I make two smart choices for coordinate transformations. I mean, in the first case, I want to look at this. Let's say, goodness, what bothers me about the volume here is the unwieldy intercepts of this object, right? I know a formula for the volume of a sphere, 4 thirds pi r cubed, but this is not a sphere. Can I transform it and make it a sphere? Let's draw a sphere of radius one. Casually. Uh, I'm just making a sketch. And this sketch doesn't look better than the last sketch, except that I want this to be a sphere of radius one. It's so a perfectly round ball. Well, think about this sphere as this being a pile of mud that I'm going to roll into a perfectly round ball. What I'm really going to do is shrink the value on the x-axis 
from minus two to two to be the value on, let's say, the u axis, v and w. So I'm going to take transformation, what? u, v, w. Let's let u be square root of two, or x divided by the square root of two. Let's let v be y divided by the square root of three. Let's let w be z divided by square root of four, which is z divided by two. Look at that transformation. This is just a scaling in each coordinate. But what does it do? It changes the plus minus two on the x-axis to plus minus one on the u-axis. It changes the plus minus three on the y-axis to plus minus one on the v-axis. Changes the plus minus two on the z-axis to just a simple plus minus one on the w-axis. Remember this transformation goes two ways. What we just described is how to change x, y, and z into w, v, and u. But for my Jacobian, I need to know how to calculate this way. I need to know the formulas for x, y, and z in terms of u, v, and w. But since this is just a scaling, a stretching or shrinking, I can easily solve for x, y, and z here. Say root two u, root three v, and two w. So now I have this sphere, let's call the sphere S. And I have a very simple Jacobian to go from u, v, and w, to go from x to u, v, and w. So this Jacobian is the determinant of a three by three matrix, but notice partial x partial u is root two, partial y partial v is root three, and partial z partial w is two. All the other partial derivatives, partial x partial v zero, partial x partial w zero, partial y partial u, zero, partial y partial w, zero, partial z partial u, zero, partial z partial v, zero. All these other derivatives are zero. And if you take the determinant of this three by three matrix, as you've done determinants, you really just had the product of root two, root three, and two. So you have root six times two. So let's write down what we've accomplished. The volume of this egg in XYZ space is what I'm interested in computing. And now I've recast it as a sphere volume in the UVW space. I have to pay for that with a factor of two root six. And two root six absolute value is two root six. So I'm not leaving out the absolute values. I'm just executing them. But now let's do one more change to finish this problem without having to do any integration. Because you understand that even in order to execute this double integral over, you know, Sorry, I'm doing triple integrals here because I'm expressing the volume. So triple integral over R, triple integral over S. That's how I calculate volume. But even to express this triple integral over S, I've got to let U, V, and W, U range from minus one to one, then V ranges from square root negative of one minus U squared to square root positive of one minus U squared. Then W ranges negative square root one minus u squared minus v squared. I mean, if I describe this rectangularly, I'm in a world of pain, but maybe I could think about it in spherical coordinates. And the spherical coordinates are rho,
e rho, e phi, e theta. This is very easy to describe in spherical coordinates. So let's change to rho, phi, and theta. And the rho limits of the sphere are zero to one. The phi limits of the sphere are zero to pi. And the theta limits of the sphere are zero to two pi. So the constant limits in spherical coordinates are expressing that I'm just integrating over this block. Zero to one, zero to pi, zero to two pi. That would be very, very sweet limits. Let's write them. Let's call this region here, I don't know, B for block. So I got to set the limits over B and I got to integrate the volume, rho, phi, and theta. And I already have this two root six modification factor from the first Jacobian, but now I have another Jacobian in here. I have the Jacobian rho, phi, and theta. And that's a big mess to calculate, but we've already stated that that's rho squared sine phi. Right, so I have a second Jacobian here. I'll indicate it in the back as rho squared sine phi. And now I can integrate constant limits. Theta from zero to two pi, phi from zero to pi, and rho from zero to one, two root six, rho squared sine phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. So I integrate with respect to rho from zero to one. This rho turns into one third rho cubed. At one, that's one third, and at zero, that's zero. So the first integral, I'll just keep these two limits on the outside. The first integral is one third. Times two pi over six times sine phi d phi d theta. And now the next integral is integrating sine phi with respect to phi from zero to pi. But remember, that's one bump of sine, natural sine, not changing the period or the amplitude of all. So this is worth two units. So zero to pi of this, so I'm hardly integrating. I leave this integral on the outside for theta, but integrate zero to pi of sine phi, and I just pick up a factor of two. So now I have four root six over three. One more integral to perform with respect to theta, but this is a constant with respect to theta. So I just multiply four root six over three times two pi. Now, because of this expression right here, like I'm not, there's nothing much to simplify right here, right? Eight root six over three. And I want to take that to be the volume of my egg. Well, let's find out if that actually means something. Remember, the volume of a natural sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. So, oops, I got my little pi right here. I do see a pi and I do see a four thirds. Let's think of this as four thirds and pi. But instead of the r cubed here, I see a two root six. And what was the two root six representing? 
The two root six was representing the product of the root two, root three, and two. In other words, the two root six, and I'll get in trouble for saying this, so let's be very careful how I mean this. The two root six is the product of the three radii of this egg. Now, I do not refer to these semi-major axes as radii, but it's almost like that, isn't that? Isn't the sphere radius r, radius r, radius r in general? This one's radius one. And so what I have for the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi times r times r times r. These are the three r's of a sphere. But what about an ellipsoid? What about an egg now? We've just discovered, if you did this in general, if this is a, b, and c for these three distances from center to exterior of egg on each axis, that the volume of that egg is 4 thirds pi radius times radius times radius, 4 thirds pi a, b, c. Now, I shouldn't say radius times radius times radius. So I should be careful about how I express that. But that is the volume of an egg. From now on, I can just use that as the volume of any egg I encounter. And our egg, the ABC was root two, root three times two. <coughs> That's the two root six right here. Notice I could have stopped right here in the blue space and said, oh, this is just two root six times the volume of a sphere of radius one. This is just two root six times four pi over three times one cube, which is just four pi over three. But by going backwards with the spherical coordinate transformation, notice I didn't write it because the spherical coordinate transformation is a serious mess, but I already know the Jacobian of spherical coordinate transformation. But notice I reduced that sphere to just a block. And the block was just zero to one, zero to pi, zero to two pi. That was very simple limits. And here's my Jacobian for spherical coordinate transformation. And here's the two root six which is Jacobian for the compacting of this egg. So before I go, I want to say that clearly, and I want to make sure I'm numbering my pages correctly. So this is why people know the area of an ellipse is not pi r squared, with pi a b. Do the same thing in two dimensions. And the area of an ellipse, which is a by b, is the same concept as the area of a circle, which is r by r. And again, I'm not calling a and b radii. I'm just saying A and B here are semi-major axis, semi-minor axis distance. And so same thing for a volume of an ellipsoid is four thirds pi ABC instead of four thirds pi R cubed which is the natural volume of sphere. Perfectly round ellipsoid, R by R by R, compared with a stretched out object. Mm, I can't draw this nicely, I apologize. Well, I'm just mutilating this. This is some kind of potato, it's A, by B, by C. So you can take this as a fact, but now you know how to prove it. 
if you just put generic ABC here in place of the root two, root three, two, you'd have ABC on this diagonal. You'd have the first Jacobian factor is ABC. Okay, that was what I wanted to do for you today. If in the absence of any other questions, you can still send me questions by email or check in after you see the test on Tuesday with some questions. I just wanted to do several more examples of change of variables so you feel more comfortable visualizing these objects. So I'm gonna let it go there. I do office hours online today at 10. And so I'm gonna get out of this meeting and move over to that meeting in a few minutes after I process this video and paper notes. If you have a question, send me an email and we'll incorporate that in the next session or I'll answer people individually. Have a good day.